Yes, thank you very much. Um, so I'd just like to start by acknowledging uh, that we are meeting here on the Algonquins unceded territory and to thank them for welcoming us and to thank the elder this morning for his words and, and his prayer. Just a bit of background for my, on myself. Um, you know, I'm a settler. My ancestors on both sides of my family, I think, came mainly from Scotland. And uh, I grew up in Saskatchewan. So my, on my father's side, uh, our family homesteaded in southeastern Saskatchewan in the late 1880s. So this is just after the Real Resistance. And it's actually on the Treaty 2 territory. Uh, but when I grew up in Regina, I knew nothing about the treaties or, you know, we used to go down and visit the relatives on the family farm. I didn't know that that had been Indian land before, that it was, it was uh, Cree uh, or Soto, Soto land. And even in university, so I went to university in Saskatoon in the 1960s. I took, I majored in history. We didn't learn anything about the treaties. Here we are studying Canadian history in Saskatchewan, and that late in the 1960s, we weren't being taught about the treaties in university. Now, I know that has changed. You know, there are some very good uh, historians at the University of Saskatchewan, people like Blair Stonechild and, and Jim Miller and so on, who, who devote a lot of time and, and research and teaching to these matters. But I guess the point here is that public education is so important. So it's not just for First Nations people to learn about the impact of the Indian Act and how to move out of it, but for other Canadians to understand this, understand our history, understand how oppressive it has been for Indigenous peoples, and what needs to be done to change that, right? It just can't go on uh, the way it has been. So I'm here not to tell people the way I think it should be or tell you what to do. I'm here as a resource person and you know I'm happy to take any kind of questions and so on. My expertise is in Canadian law and the Canadian Constitution. So you know that's what I'm going to be talking about and explaining. I don't have any expertise on Indigenous law, Indigenous constitutions and so on. So I'm also here to learn from, from you. So we've heard quite a bit about the Indian Act already, and I just want to emphasize that the, and we've heard it before, but I think it's so important, the government's authority in the Indian Act is delegated authority. And it comes from Parliament, and Parliament got that authority from Section 9124 of the 1867 British North America Act. Okay, so it's, Actually, the UK Parliament, who gave the authority to Canada through Section 9124 to legislate and to enact the Indian Act, and of course, Parliament exercised that authority in 1876. The band council system was imposed on First Nations in this country. It was imposed without their consent. And of course, First Nations had their own forms of government and their own systems of law prior to that time, of course, prior to European colonization. And those systems continued and were not extinguished by European acquisition of sovereignty or assertion of sovereignty. They weren't extinguished by Confederation. They weren't extinguished by the Indian Act. However, the Indian Act, of course, imposed or tried to impose limits on those. And part of that, of course, was the band council system. 
but of course other oppressive elements as well, right? The, the banning of the pot, pot latch and the Sundance and the control that the Indian agents exercised over the reserves and over the, uh, the indigenous populations on the reserves. Residential schools, of course, were all part of this system of oppression and this attempt to assimilate indigenous peoples into Canadian society. When the First Nations of British Columbia, who had been asserting their land rights for, for decades, uh, in the 1920s were planning to go to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in London, England, to have that body decide on their land rights. Uh, Canada, and this was mentioned by Chris earlier on, Canada enacted, a, the Parliament of Canada enacted an amendment to the Indian Act that made it illegal to, for anyone to raise money or to pay anyone in order to pursue any Indian claim. So basically they, they just shut down any possibility of litigation. In many cases, uh, indigenous people just took their practices underground, right? The potlatch and so on. Yes, there was a climate of fear and people weren't, didn't feel that they could engage in their, their customary governance, uh, follow their own laws and so on, but I think they often did continue to do that uh, sort of out of sight of the Canadian government. Well, some of the rep repressive measures were removed in 1951 when the Indian Act was amended or revised. Uh, so, you know, the ban on the potlatch and the Sundance uh, were removed at that time, and so was the section about uh, raising and paying money for, for uh, pursuing Indian claims. But, you know, the whole structure basically remained in place as well as the ban council system. Um, El Elder Albert mentioned that First Nations did get the right to vote in federal elections in 1960. That was an important, important change. And also during this, the 1960s, I mean, there was a climate in North America, partly in the United States, you know, of civil rights, of, and, and the youth at the, t at the time were quite rebellious. I mean, that was my generation, right, growing up in the 60s. And uh, I think that sort of change in the social and political atmosphere also had an impact in relation to indigenous peoples. Of course, there was the infamous white paper of 1969, and that in fact helped indigenous people in Canada sort of organize politically and galvanize in opposition to that document. So it all actually was, supposed to be very assimilationist, but it had the opposite effect. And I think that was an important event, as well as the Calder decision in 1973, leading up to 1982 and the inclusion of Section 35 in the Canadian Constitution. So I, I regard the inclusion of Section 35 as a real watershed. And First Nations people, of course, have always maintained that Section 35 includes the inherent right of self-government. Now, during the constitutional conferences in the 1980s, and Chris mentioned this as well, uh, the main issue was self-government. And the indigenous uh, leaders at the table were saying, well, it's already in Section 35, you know, that should be acknowledged expressly, whereas the, some of the provinces in particular were very resistant. And so it just didn't happen at that time. In 1995, the federal government acknowledged that First Nations have an inherent right of self-government. They made a policy statement uh, acknowledging that, but the federal government still regarded it as a contingent right. In other words, they recognized its existence in principle, but in order for it to actually be implemented and put into practice, negotiations had to be 
had to take place with the provinces and the feds, and they had to agree on the scope of the self-government powers. Okay, so you know that has led to some of the modern treaties. Uh, the Nishka Treaty, I think, is the first one where self-government provisions are actually included in the treaty itself as a result of that policy. But federal government didn't acknowledge that First Nations have an inherent right that they can just exercise themselves. Um, so in my opinion, this contingent right approach to the right of self-government is, is, is just wrong. And I think what Section 35 did was acknowledge, or finally acknowledge, in the Canadian Constitution that Indigenous peoples are partners in confederation. They're equal partners. That's where the, the nation to nation relationship comes in. And that uh, Section 35 really provides the constitutional space for Indigenous self-government, as well as for other rights, for treaty rights, you know, for Aboriginal title, for hunting and fishing rights, and so on. But very importantly, I regard Section 35 as, as the space, the constitutional space for Indigenous self-government in Canada. So it's somewhat similar to sections 91 and 24 of the original BNA Act. Okay, so section 91, of course, is the, the federal government's authority. Section 92, that's provincial government's authority. Section 35 is indigenous governance authority. The difference, however, is that sections 91 and 24 are really delegated authority. That authority came from the UK Parliament and was given to Canada, to the Parliament of Canada, and to the provincial legislatures. Whereas the inherent right to self-government in Section 35 is just that, it's inherent. It doesn't come from the Canadian Constitution. It comes from the fact that Indigenous peoples were here when the Europeans arrived. They had their own systems of government, their own laws, their own cultures, their own political uh, uh, organizations and means of governing, ways of governing themselves, and those continued. And we finally get constitutional space for that acknowledged and included in Section 35. So the right in Section 35, the inherent right of self-government is not contingent. It doesn't depend on getting permission from the federal government or the province in order to exercise it. You know, the feds don't ask for permission to act, enact laws of parliament. Uh, the provinces don't ask for permission. Indigenous people shouldn't either. There should be, you know, where there are conflicts, there should be respectful nation-to-nation -nation negotiations in order to resolve those conflicts. But it's not a matter of First Nations needing permission from other governments in order to exercise their inherent rights. Okay, so how have the Canadian courts dealt with the right of self-government? Well, in my respectful opinion, in quite a confused manner. Uh, the only case where the Supreme Court has really dealt with this issue directly is the Pemajuan case in 1996. And in that case, two First Nations in Ontario claimed that they have a right to self-government in relation to their reserve lands, and specifically over the creation of gaming and the regulation of gaming on their reserves. Now, I don't want to criticize the First Nations who were involved in this case or their legal counsel, but strategically, it was not a good fact pattern. It was not a good claim to bring to the Supreme Court for the first time on the issue of self-government because the, the court just wasn't sympathetic to a right of self-government over gaming that they're arguing that the Criminal Code of Canada doesn't apply to them in relation to this matter. And the Supreme Court 
denied that they had a right of self-government over gaming on their reserves. But the real problem with the decision was the way in which the Supreme Court arrived at that decision. And they arrived at it by applying the uh, test that they'd created just the week before in the Vanderpeet case, which is the integral to the distinctive culture test. In other words, in Pemajuan, the First Nations would have had to prove that gaming and the regulation of gaming was integral to their distinctive cultures. It was a, a practice, custom, and tradition integral to those cultures at the time of contact with Europeans. And for those uh, Anishinaabe First Nations, that was probably at least 300 years ago, right? I mean, this is just an absurd standard that the court was applying. And you know, it would have meant that rights to self-government are only over things they did 300 years ago and that they regulated 300 years ago. And not only that, it's a piecemeal approach. So they would have had to prove, okay, this is in relation to gaming. If they could establish that, it doesn't mean they've got uh, a right to self-government over anything else, right? So it's just, I mean, an absurd approach, a very un unfortunate <coughs> decision from the Supreme Court. Fortunately, since that time, we have had a much more positive decision from the BC Supreme Court, but that's only a trial decision. But Justice Williamson, in the Campbell case in 2000, uh, found that there is an inherent right to self-government in relation to Aboriginal title lands. And that was in relation to the Nishka Treaty. Now, I don't, I could get into that in more detail, but what's important here is that Justice Williamson said, well, the Supreme Court told us in Delgamook that Aboriginal title to land is a communal right and that the community has the right to make decisions in relation to their Aboriginal title because it's a communal right. And what Justice Williamson said, well, if you've got a big community, it could be you know thousands of people, how are they gonna make decisions in relation to their land rights without a political structure? And so he said, they, they must have a right of self-government in relation to their Aboriginal title. Well, one can apply the same reasoning to all the other rights that are in Section 35. Not just Aboriginal title to land, but you know, hunting and fishing rights, you know, rights in relation to, to families and culture, and treaty rights as well. They're all communal rights, and on the basis of the reasoning of Justice Williamson, they would all be, there'd be self-government rights in relation to all those things. Okay. Satsen also mentioned this morning about uh, what Justice Binney said at the conference in, in Edmonton. Uh, now, he's no longer in the Supreme Court. Of course, he retired, but you know, it's good to hear a, chief, a, a justice of the Supreme Court of Canada making those kind uh, of remarks. And for me, it's, it's really not consistent with the Pemajuan decision, because Pemajuan really is an empty box approach. It's like, okay, you say you've got a right to self-government, prove it, and prove it in relation to every single power that you're claiming the right over. So the box is empty, it's up to First Nations to prove it on an impossible burden of proof, right? It's just, it's just not realistic. So what Binney seemed to be saying, according to, I wasn't there, but uh, Satsang was saying that, uh, you know, he regards Section 35 as a full box, and I think that's the right approach. Uh, as I say, Williamson in the Campbell decision went quite a long way in that direction, but I think we can also look south of the border to the United States, and there's a model down there. So ever since the 1830s, the Supreme Court in the United States have acknowledged, has acknowledged that the, well, they're not First Nations there, they're usually called Indian nations or tribes, that the Indian nations in the United States uh, were completely sovereign before the Europeans arrived, 
and the arrival of the Europeans and colonization diminished but not did not take away their rights to self-government. So even after European colonization and the creation of the United States, the Indian nations there retained their internal sovereignty. So what they did lose was the external sovereignty in the sense of dealing with foreign nations, foreign affairs, and stuff like that. So after they became you know, incorporated within the United States, in their external relations, they had to deal with the United States. But internally, they, re they retained their own inherent right to self-government, their own sovereignty. They used that term in the United States. They retained their own tribal sovereignty and the right to govern themselves their territories and, and their peoples within the lands that they were able to retain. In other words, within Indian country. Now, in the United States, Congress has what's called plenary power, so it can reduce or even take away the right of the Indian tribes to govern themselves. And it has done that to some extent. Uh, there was a period of termination during the 1950s where some of the tribes were actually terminated in the sense of losing their status under federal law. In other ways, their rights were diminished uh, through, for example, the Major Crimes Act back in the 1880s or during the 1960s, uh, the um, uh, Indian Civil Rights Act. But nonetheless, the tribes there have retained their inherent right to self-government to the extent that it has not been taken away. So in the United States, they start with a phone box. And it's up to the US government to prove that the right of self-government has actually been diminished. Whereas the Pomaduan approach in Canada, you start with an empty box and the burden of proof, the onus is on First Nations, indigenous peoples, to fill that box by meeting what I, I called an impossible burden of proof. Now, there is one advantage in Canada, well, at least one advantage over the American system, and that is since 1982, Aboriginal treaty rights have constitutional protection. They don't in the United States. So, as I said, Congress has plenary power in relation to them and can take them away by legislative acts of Congress. In Canada, since 1982, even Parliament cannot extinguish Aboriginal rights and treaty rights. Uh, however, it can still infringe them if it can meet the justification test for infringement in the Sparrow case, which the Supreme Court decided in 1990. Okay, um, so I think the inherent right to self-government is a full box. It provides First Nations with you know, a phone box of powers that they can exercise without anyone else's permission. But what if this exercise of jurisdiction comes into conflict with federal and provincial laws? Okay, that's a big issue and something people really have to think about. Uh, my view is that indigenous laws in relation to their own citizens and in relation to their own territories should generally take precedence over provincial and federal laws. And the reason for that is that Section 35 provides them with constitutional protection against federal and provincial laws. Now, there's a limit on that, and it goes back to what I said about justifiable infringement that federal and provincial laws could infringe on indigenous rights to self-government if that can be justified under the Sparrow test. Okay, so there is that limit. But I do think that the bar for infringement is actually quite high. I mean, we don't have much case law testing this, and we don't have any case law testing it in relation to the right of self-government. But just to give, uh, an example, a hypothetical example, 
if a First Nation has its own laws respecting the use of its Aboriginal title lands, for example, how could the application of provincial laws to those same lands be justified? So what that means is that it's vital for First Nations to in fact have their own laws in relation to land and in relation to anything else that they want to exercise government authority over. And that those laws could either be traditional laws that have been in, in place and that people uh, are still aware of and still follow, or they could be laws that are made in modern times through the exercise of self-government. And what we're talking about here is laws not just on reserves, okay? So going back to what I said earlier, it's, rem it's important to remember that the delegated authority through the Indian Act and bank councils applies on reserves. It doesn't apply outside the reserves to the traditional territory. So the inherent governance authority we're talking about is much broader in terms of not only the powers that are there, but also the territorial scope of those, those powers. If Indigenous people or First Nations don't have their own laws in relation to matters, then what's gonna happen is that federal and provincial laws are gonna apply by default, okay? So if you want, don't want those laws to apply, if you want to govern your people and your territories in accordance with your own laws and cultures and traditions, then those laws have to be in place and have to be visible, right? Um, and so th this, this is, is, is really important. As I say, otherwise federal and provincial laws are going to apply by default. And what is important here, too, is capacity building, right? And I, I know we're going to talk more about these matters, but, you know, you can't just all of a sudden transition from the Indian Act to full inherent right government. And First Nations can actually do that incrementally if they wish. You know, there may be certain areas where you think, well, this is an important area for us to start. You know, family matters, for example, child welfare, uh, maybe inheritance laws, laws around family relations between spouses and so on. Um, if that kind of case had gone to the Supreme Court instead of Pemajuan, I think we might have got a very different decision from the court. Right? But those might be good kind of areas to start in, as well as things in relation to things like hunting and fishing. I mean, people have their traditional laws in relation to these things. And uh, it's a matter of, you know, getting out on the land, you know, practicing the rights, practicing the law, and, and so on. Well, I'm, I'm going to end that there. I've said enough, but uh, I really appreciate, you know, engaging in more discussion here. You know, I'm completely open to, to questions and different points of view. As I said, I'm not here to tell anyone what they should do or how it should be, but really to tell you what the Canadian legal system has decided so far. But I think, you know, as was said earlier, there's a, a window of opportunity here because I think we have a federal government that is sympathetic. In, in some sense, I think they're not sure what to do, right? They're looking for guidance. They're looking for help and assistance, you know, from everyone, the people in this room, for Indigenous people across Canada and uh, I was pleased to be referred to as an ally because, you know, my own work has always been supportive of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous rights. So I'll, I'll just end with that. Thank you. Thank you.